This Rooted episode is about the importance of intergenerational relationships, mentor-mentee stuff. And so we're trying to mimic a little bit of what Joel attracts, where if you go to Polyface and you go eat dinner with them, it's, he's surrounded by young people. And that's something I think that is, is inspiring. And I think tonight what we'll do for the content for Rooted is, I've been asking him questions all day and we'll ask him more tomorrow. So how about you, I'm gonna put it in front of you guys to ask questions. And I'm thinking more along the lines of lifestyle. I mean, he's been married 40, how many years? 40, almost 41. He's been married 41 years. He has sons that, uh, which both of his children are involved in the business in some way or the other. You know, has ran business, his own business for decades, put, puts out content, has lovers, has haters. <laughs> uh, so let's kind of go there with, with lifestyle type questions. But I'm gonna let you guys have at it. You got 30 minutes with Joel Salatin. Let's do it. If Teresa were here, she would say that's enough time for about one question. Yes. Okay. So, so if y'all don't ask questions, I'm going to start calling on you. Brianna, I know you. Come on. You've got really, you, always have, good you have really good, insightful questions. Yeah, give me a minute. Ari is already questioning okay. him a minute ago. All right, Ben. Meg has one. Meg has one. Oh, here we go. How do you deal with the haters? How do you deal with the haters? Uh, well, it depends, on, it depends on what they hate you for. I mean, um, <laughs> Well, no, it's true. Uh, you, um, so we have haters who think we're murderers because we slaughter animals. So there's the, the real militant vegan, you know, militant vegan crowd. Um, and we, you know, we don't, we don't argue with them. I mean, that's a, that's a spiritual thing and, and it's a, you know, it's, it's an urban disease. I like that. <laughs> it's an urban disease, and we, we just don't fight with it. Um, yeah, g generally, I mean, the quick answer is <laughs> don't fight back. Just let it be. Um, because... Uh, mm. What about when someone attacks your character? Yeah. Do you ever feel, like, beaten down? Um... Well, if some, I mean, one of the, a common one is, well, you're not really a farmer, you're just a writer, you, you, you live off your books. And for somebody like that, I would simply say, well, you know, we were farming for, uh, we were farming for 12 years before we did the first book. And it was farm savings that paid for the printing of the first two books. And so, um, you know, initially the farm subsidized the books and now the books just give us some nice wiggle room that we've leveraged our experience and, and storytelling ability on. And it gives a little bit of wiggle room to do some things we wouldn't have done otherwise. But, um, you know, the farm's still very viable. And of course, that's a big deal for Daniel, our son, who runs day-to-day -day operations because he doesn't have books under his belt. So he's he really feels the whatever the pressure of making sure the farm is still a credible, a, a credible thing, even with our, you know, presence mm -hmm. out there. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, pushback comes from different, different directions like that. Uh, you know, it, a lot of it's the attitude, you know, if somebody's just wanting to tear you down. Um, we just, we just don't respond or don't say anything. It, it, there's, there's no point in it. Uh, but, but if somebody asks, uh, you know, in good faith, why can't I get uh, soy-free birds from you? Well, then we love anybody that's, that's, that's a true seeker. Um, we love those and answer them in full. But there's no argument. They're, they're actually seeking. They're not, they're not just, you know, bagging you. Um, Generally, the ones that, ones that bag you, uh, they, they just don't get a response. It just, it's not worth it. You can't, you can't reason. You can't change your mind. You know, it, it, they've, they've read something, seen something, heard something, and they just want to be negative. Yeah. Well, yeah. Two questions in one. Okay. Okay, so I'm seeing that my generation, the younger people, I'm 26, 
we we're tired of congested city life. I want to get out there. I want to have more freedom, more more real life type stuff, not just packaged everything. We want to have mm. want to be able to s- see our food come from you know seed to harvest that type of thing. Mm-hmm. And there's like this gap there inside. But also I'm seeing that because because I've kind of experienced that growing up on a farm. I'm seeing that that's not the res- that's not the the uh, end all be all. Like you can you can go from city life to having a homestead and everything to do with healthy food and healthy living. But what are the things that you that you've seen are like more the internal health, like internal fulfilling things that beyond you know growing your own food and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So maybe th- to narrow that down would be what are the top th- two things that you would recommend people do to be fulfilled before they even have any kind of farm or whatever. Mm. But then also the top two things to get towards working towards more of a healthy lifestyle. If that makes sense. Uh, it's a like pretty a wide open. Uh, I guess I guess well, the first thing I would is say is uh, is get rid of your TV. Mm. That'd be the first thing. Or phone. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> Nowadays it's phone. phone yeah. Okay, phone, whatever, your <laughs> I- iPhone, iPhone. <laughs> yeah, unplug. Um, I mean, the average American male between 25 and 35 spends 20 hours a week playing video games. So I, I think, I mean, think what you could do for 20 hours a week if all the, if the average male in the U.S. put 20 hours a week in something productive other than video games. Uh, I mean, we're, we're losing a lot of whatever, innovation, labor, ideas, um, things uh, in that. So, so um, yeah, g- get off the electronic highway is certainly would be very, very top on my list. And you're looking at a guy that doesn't even have a smartphone. You know, I've got a <laughs> flip, flip, flip phone. But, you know, fortunately I have, you know, I have people in the, in the farm business that do have an iPhone. I'm glad somebody does. Because they're pretty, they're important today. But um, you know, it's like a, it's like I heard a gal say. She says, if you know, if you don't have one, you're really missing out. And it, but if you, if you're on it all the time, you're even making a bigger mistake. You're really so, missing out. Yeah. So I think I think there's there's something said for that. Um, and the next thing I would say, as far as uh, so that's one, the, the the just the electronic highway. And I would say. The second thing would be to find and support um, the alternative tribe. And Mm. by that I mean um, whatever is unorthodox. This is farming, health, education, investment, uh, whatever it is, that that the, the orthodox position is um, is suspect, and the thing is, the unorthodox position is not going to come knocking on your door. You know, by definition, it's the orthodox that's going to come knocking on the door. That's the one you're going to see. You know, the ads for on YouTube. That's the one you're going to see all this other stuff for. So you have to you have to uh, invest uh, time and energy in in the unorthodox view whatever that is. And generally, the unorthodox view um, has more truth to it than the orthodox one. And, but, but, but it's not on the front page of the newspaper. You know. It doesn't get the advertising. It doesn't get the play. And so you know, the biblical principle of the narrow way and the broad way is very, very real. And you've got to seek the narrow way. It's there. But you have to you have to seek. I mean, we deal with people all the time that want the world to change. I want the world to be changed, but I don't want to make any changes. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I always I always tell the like the the folks the climate the the rabid climate changers that we're all going to be crispy critters in fifty years, you know, because um, of climate change. That if if that were really true. You wouldn't be driving your kids three hours one way, your, your five-year-old three hours one way to a soccer game. 
If that were really true, you'd rip up your yard, be planting vegetables in it, having a compost pile, and you'd do everything possible to not even put garbage on a, on a trash truck. You, you know what I'm saying? And so, you know, these are, people want a different, a different outcome without changing anything. And, and people want to know, they want to know the, the real scoop behind yep. X. Well, you got to, you got to put some time and attention on behind X yeah. to find it. We're used to quick fixes and ramen noodles. Right, right, happen. right. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, convenience is a, convenience is a real, you know, is a real problem. And, um, and you have to appreciate that, that truth, truth doesn't come knocking on your door. Uh, you have to want to see mm. truth. Untruth is what comes knocking on your door. You know, that, that's what comes knocking. Brandon? Sorry. Uh, speaking of unorthodox views, I think an interesting one is rest. I think that's a really unorthodox thing to go after. Because I think, like, uh, at least in my world, I'm surrounded by people who hustle, which, I, which is fine. Especially in the, in the mothering world, it's a big thing right now to have a side hustle. And you see all these women retiring their husbands, even. Um, so there's a lot of pressure right now in my generation on women to stay home, homeschool, and have a side hustle. Not right? only a side hustle, but one that one that retires their husband. One that makes enough money so that your husband doesn't have to go out and work another yeah. job. Yeah, and you see, we, I see women accomplishing that very, very often. So that's <laughs> partly where I'm coming from. I'm also surrounded by people work very, very hard. You obviously worked very, very hard. Um, raising a family, starting a farm, um, basically changing careers early on, right? Because you were a reporter. Mm -hmm. um, being married for 40 plus years, writing books. You've obviously That's a real hustle. <laughs> you really accomplished a lot, but where um, I think an unorthodox view that isn't really ever brought up is one of rest. And so where does that fit in to your life? Um, mm. Does it? It's okay if it doesn't. But like, where does that fit into your life? You could even maybe give examples of specifically or, or not. Just, I'm just curious what you think about the idea of rest. Yeah, well, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in, um, in memory commas of life. And, um, and what I mean by that is most, again, in our, in our segregated um, uh, culture, we think that well, we, we've got to go away. I mean, I even, even, even mm -hmm. vacation mm -hmm. becomes a hustle. Mm -hmm. We got to go, we got to get plane tickets, we got to, you know, go somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm suggesting that, that some, some in-home or at-home um, comma memories, uh, uh, two hours at a, at a fire pit, uh, you know, outside. I mean, we, well, I mean, we, we just spent, um, because we have a, a big community, there's 25 of us living on the farm, it's a pretty big deal. So we splurged and spent $1,000 on uh, illegal fireworks. You can't get fireworks <laughs> in Virginia. So we went across the border in Tennessee and got $1,000 worth of fireworks and had a, had a community free, you know, party with our staff and extended friends, church stuff, to come out and, and at the farm and have a fireworks display. Well, you know, the, the yeah. Yeah. The illegal fireworks. Yeah, illegal fireworks. Sounds friends. like somebody I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and of course, you know, the kids are running around with sparklers and it was a great time. We we uh, one one guy read the Declaration of Independence all the way through. We sang the national anthem. Um, you know, and then we had these fireworks and in fact uh, Daniel was in charge of the fireworks. And so <laughs> when we when we sang the national anthem and and hit the rockets, red glare he sent off fireworks right on that phrase. Yeah, it was the Whitney. coolest thing in the world. <laughs> it was like the Blue Angels flew over at, you know, at a, 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 a millionth of price. So, yeah, new goal, man. New yeah, goal. Yeah. So all I'm saying is uh, be creative. Be creative at creating memorable commas that are cheap and, 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 and self-created, you know. Uh, 
the kids can do theater. You can cook hot dogs. We call them yard nicks in the yard, you know. Uh, you don't have to go anywhere. You, and when you look back at your life, you know, you look back at your childhood, isn't it those kinds of things you remember? Oh, yeah. You know, and so, mm -hmm. so uh, that's, that's one. For me, um, uh, 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 two things I'll say. One was, Dad always said, uh, he said, you cannot spend more than four hours a day doing chores. So chores are things that you have to do every day at the same time because you need time in the day to recharge whether it's to innovate, construct, think, read, whatever it is. Um, and so that's one reason why dairy farmers are so non-innovative because they spend so much time every day on chores, there's no energy or time left to, to, to think you know, creatively. Um, I think it's one reason why as you go north, more innovative farmers are in the north than in the south because they don't have a winter. They don't have to stop. So in the South, oh, in, the south they don't worry. Yeah. in the South, your season's longer. Goodness, in Al Louisiana, Alabama, South Georgia, mm -hmm. you never have to stop. <laughs> and so I can tell you, you, know, you can look at my, at my speaking tours over the you know, 30 years, and I've probably spoken five to one north of the Mason-Dixon line rather than south of the Mason-Dixon line. And I think a lot of it is because in the South, you have a longer season, and so you just don't have to stop. Yeah. Whereas the North, blizzards and stuff, you know, they drive people in, and you have to sit, and you, I wonder why we're doing it. You have to think time, you know. It's, it's an imposed rest. And um, so you, know, you got you to gotta think about that. Finally, I'll just say for me, um, I'm pretty, pretty uh, direct about taking Sunday off. And um, it's one of the things I've started a couple of years ago was Saturday night, I turn off the computer, the laptop, everything, and I don't look at it again till Monday. I mean, I turn it off, off button, off. It rests too. And, um, and I have just found that very, very liberating uh -huh. to, to, to take that imposed, you know, no electronic um, uh, position on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love what you say about the memorable commas. My husband is so good at that. Mm. He is so good at that. It's because that's the way he was raised, too. Mm -hmm. I bet your family was yeah. good at that, too. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love that. That's something that um, I have found over the years is very hard for me, is to actually enjoy mm. the labor of my hands. Um, especially like the first four years on our farm, just going, 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 going. And then sometimes we sit down in the evening and look around and be like, this is the most amazing thing in the world. Or people come over. Yeah. Like, this is amazing. And you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, it is amazing. <laughs> 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 but because, because and Arthur, um, my husband, is, uh, is often talking about we need to take more time to just enjoy our land and our Watch place. And, um, mm -hmm. Like I said, he's way better at that. He's way better at stopping and playing with the kids and you know, making a bonfire getting hot dogs and not worrying about their vegetables. I'm always like, where are we going to be eating just hot dogs, you know? <laughs> so I love that. I think memorable commas and like really, that's something that's been on my heart for a long time is like weaving rest. Because we take a Sabbath. We take Sunday off pretty religiously. Um, or we take Saturdays if church is going to be next the next day. Um, but I've always felt like it's not quite enough. It's like when like the, the big self-care movement. Not, not that I think anything's wrong with that, but I'm always like, but when you get back from your massage, it's all still there. Mm. So like for me, I've been on kind of this this intentional seeking of like how to live in a yeah. place of rest. And I love the memorable commas. That's, cute. that's a cool name for it. <laughs> I think that's a good way to do it. Good, good. We all are entrepreneurs and beginner farmers and homesteaders and um, I guess I'm just trying to figure out my role in the helping my husband be an entrepreneur and mm. navigate um, sowing the land and also turning that into a business. Tell me about your wife, Teresa, and how mm. she supports you throughout all these years mm. with like, just different ventures that you've taken on. Good question. And I have a question. That's a great question. Just something to add to that that'll help. Teddy. She worked, didn't she? She was a teacher? 
That's my mother. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. Teresa taught for one semester okay. after college. So she was, stay she was, I'm just curious because I think that context is helpful too. Was she a stay at home mom? Yep. She, mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yep, for the whole time. Except before we were married, she taught for one, right out of high school, I mean right out of college, uh, there was a home ec teacher that had to take maternity leave uh -huh. in the high school and they called Teresa. She didn't have a teaching certificate. They said, look, we desperately need somebody. So well, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do the semester for you. And so she did the semester. Okay. And that was a one and done deal. She, she knew. I'm she sure she was a wonderful teacher, but she, that wasn't her. She didn't like it. <laughs> she didn't like it. Um, but no, no. So she, so, so um, yeah, we got married. And she, she still worked a part-time thing down at the local, uh, down at a fabric store that used to be there. Of course, we don't have any fabric stores anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then, you know, as soon as uh, Daniel was born, then she was at home full time. And that was, you know, a little less than a year after we were married. Yeah. So he came early, um, which we're really thankful for because we're young grandparents. Um, and so, so how she has helped. Not so much financially, but like no, how no. she supports you. Yeah, yeah. Like no, I knew the question's okay. not, yeah, because she... Um, she didn't have the financial, but what she did, she, what, and does, um, well, we say, we say, I run outside, she runs inside. Mm -hmm. So the house is her domain. So I don't ever have to worry about being embarrassed about having somebody that's come to see the farm and they trail into the house with me. I never have to worry about being embarrassed about what the house is going to be like or what, you know, what they're going to find. Um, or that she can't whip together a, a meal or a, a plate of cheese and pickles and, you know, some, some refreshment. Uh, you know, she just, she can, you know, she can cook. She, now with the stewards and apprentices, you know, she's a top-notch seamstress. So somebody's getting married, she alters the wedding dress. She, you know, they come to her with sewing projects. I mean, she's the go-to. She's the, I mean, she just runs the house. She just has every, you know, she cans. The, the, the young people love to come in and can with her. She cans, I don't know, 800 quarts of stuff uh, a summer. And so she'll have the kitchen full of these young people learn how to can applesauce and crank the food mill and, you know, run the Mia Maya to tease out the uh, grape juice. And, and um, I mean, she's just that, that, that nest builder. That's a really great thing that I don't... <laughs> You know, it's the Proverbs uh, woman, you know, where, you know, she, she keeps everything in place, in order, whatever, and, and I, don't, I don't have to worry about, do we have food, do we, do we have, do I have clothes, do, do, so I never have to worry about any of that, and so, um, so that frees me up to use my energy and creativity to mm. you know, be what I'm supposed to be. And so that, that, that is, I mean, she's, she's amazing. You know, she's, you know, the song, you are the wind beneath my wings. Mm -hmm. That's Teresa. She's the wind beneath my wings. You know, she, she's, she's not in the limelight, but um, mm -hmm. of course, Wendy, who's my personal assistant, um, she says, Joel might be the head, but Teresa's the neck. Mm. And she turns his head everywhere <laughs> she wants to turn. <laughs> hey, we're all thankful so for Teresa. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I like your answer. She's amazing. your answer. I do have a question to kind of add to it. Um, so you're the creative, you've got all this creativity, obviously, and entrepreneurial ambition and energy. Um, have you always managed that yourself? Or have you needed people to help keep you directed before you go on to other projects, before you have 10 more ideas? <laughs> Is Teresa a part of that, or have y'all always kind of kept these more distinct roles? Um, yeah, we, we've kept some pretty distinct roles, and, and um, fortunately she just, you know, she gives me so much freedom to just go and do and be, and I don't have to worry about I don't know what, you know, she just takes care of me. That's all I can say, you know? Yeah. And, so, and so I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Um, so as far as creativity and projects and things like that, 
uh, I, I have always said I'm not that smart. I just have to figure out who to hook my, hook, who to hook my wagon to. Okay. And, uh, and so I'm constantly looking for collaborators, relationships mm. that, can, that can push me beyond what I would do otherwise. So, for example, you know, we had a guy, a customer, who um, pushed us to start selling to restaurants. I wouldn't have done that probably on my own, not necessarily. Um, the thing yet, you, you know, a lot of people think entrepreneurs are just, they just like to jump off a cliff. I like to jump off a cliff. If I'm going to jump off a cliff, I don't know there's a parachute, okay? So, so, um, so I'm not... I'm entrepreneurial, but I'm not necessarily foolishly intrepid or, or foolhardy. In, you know, there's a, there's a fine line between um, uh, courage and foolhardiness. And um, so, for example, um, another, our first apprentice, uh, Ty, um, a guy came to me and he wanted me to, to uh, lease his farm. And I said, no, you know, we'd never done it. And, I don't know if it and he came to me and he said, if you'll do it, I'll, I'll run it and we can split the profits. And I said, okay, if you want to be in charge of it, that's fine. And so we did it. And now, you know, we lease, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 properties uh, in the area. And it's, a, you know, it's huge. And, and, and they have become the germination tray for these young people that come through our program and, you know, Jimmy, you go run this one, and, and, and Amy, you go run that one, and, you know, and so they're, they're, they're these, these, these germination trays for young people to be able to go from zero to full-time farming with no debt in a day. That's kind of cool. Uh, so, so there again, that was a case of where I said no, but somebody else said to, you know, to do it. So I, you know, even though I'm very creative, I, I think... I a have a have a whatever a gift for um, for finding and nurturing um, collaborators who are strong where I'm weak, mm -hmm. and that's a really good partnership. Mm -hmm. um, and by the same token, I'm strong where they're weak. You know, so it's a mm -hmm. so it's a it's a it's a dual uh, it's a dual thing. And the second thing is, um, I love delegating. Mm -hmm. I love delegating. I love seeing somebody step up, take over something, and I can just step away and go do something else, and they can, you know, continue to, to do it. And so I, I have no desire, uh, I'll, I'll say this too, I have no desire to be rich or you know, or to amass uh, a fortune. Um, I'd like to go to the grave as a pauper with a loyal team than go rich with a team that thinks I'm a miser or selfish. And so I mean, we have chief lieutenants that make, make more than we do, but that's fine. Um, we have the joy of ownership, and and that makes sure that we've got this 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 tremendous team around us. Um, so I run ideas by them. I trust them a lot, and uh, I mean, I enjoy listening to counsel of others before I make a decision. Now there are some things that I just know are right. But uh, anybody that's spent any time at Polyface knows it's no dictatorship. I'm very much a, a, a team player, and I, I want to. I just want to keep pushing those, pushing those chicks out of the nest. You know, pushing those, pushing those team players into into places where they can, you know, excel and uh, and and do well. Was there a certain point when you, I guess, I don't know, first starting like farming or your business? that you said, okay, I need help, or I need to hi start hiring somebody. Mm. You know, what was that point, I guess, like what made you say, like, okay, we, let's make that leap and like, 
I can't do it all. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me let me say this right off the top. I've never been alone. I had a, I had a very interesting car ride with one of our former apprentices, and he was trying to launch and do his own thing, and he wasn't married yet, and um, and he was frustrated slash depressed that every, that he, he said, you know, I I just. I, I, I'm, I'm by myself, I can't do this. And in, in the ensuing discussion, it dawned on me for the first time because he you know, broached the topic and brought it up, I realized I'd never been alone. You know, I grew up there and then when, we, when I got back from college, then you know, we, I stayed there, then Teresa and I got married, we made an apartment in the attic and, um, and lived very, very frugally. We had an apartment in the attic and so, so I, I transitioned directly from, you know, mom and dad, and and then and then Teresa, and then Daniel came along, and then dad passed away. But but that time Daniel was six, and 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 the, the point is, and, and Teresa was my tractor driver, and, and we, we had a, we had a good neighbor, and we traded work together. He he worked in a factory. And so since I was on the farm all the time, I could go and, for example, rake hay so that when he got home from work, then, then you know, we, we could bail it. Um, and then he helped us unload hay early in the morning before he'd go to work. And, um, and Teresa unloaded her share of it, too. Uh, but, you know, so, so my, first, my first answer is I've never been alone. And I'm a big believer. I'm a big believer in partnerships. Marriage is the basic one and then you have others beyond that. Um, but, sec but, but as far as when did, we, when did we as a family, or when, as a family business, when did we branch out and hire somebody beyond the family? All right, so that was uh, about, um, I don't know, 20 years ago, 20, eh, not that maybe, maybe 15 years ago, I can't remember when Wendy, Wendy was our first one. And what happened there was um, Daniel and I both realized we were starting to be reluctant to go in our houses like we're out working. And we started not wanting to go to the house because we knew we'd have so many phone messages. Yeah. And by the time we got here, Phil, done with phone messages, you know, I'd go in. Every time I walked in the house, I had like six or seven phone messages. And by the time I dealt with all those, I'd have two more on the phone to try to call me while I was dealing with the six or seven, you know. Yeah. And so we decided to, um, to audit that and take a day and tick down how many phone calls we got in a day. And at our house, we got 50, and Daniel and Sherry got 50. And we looked at each other and said, yeah, said, we got to do something about this. Uh, we, we can't have this. And so we actually put an ad out for somebody to answer the phone. And... Um, and we interviewed a couple people, and we hired Wendy on salary. She was a, a young, uh, a single mom. And she could do this from her home. She didn't have to come out to the farm to do it. She, she just, you know, punched a button and, and routed the phone, that phone number to her, her phone. And she was living in Richmond at the time. And, um, and so that was our first one. And then mm -hmm. since then, it's just been one after another after another, you know, as we, as we, see the need and kind of get uh, pushed into it. Yeah, well. It doesn't like 15 years ago. You're like, when you were 49, you already been working for a very, very long time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but we, we'd already had, I mean, Daniel and Sherry were married. Well, that added a lot of hand. I mean, Sherry and Daniel and then, and then, and, and, and Rachel uh, was, a, was a big help, especially butchering chickens and, and, um, and, Mom uh, worked with us, uh, uh, not, not the heavy work, but some. Dad had uh, died in 88. But, uh, you know, we started, we started the apprenticeship program 25 years ago. Okay. And so we had, we had apprentices, a couple of them. And, and that started, uh, we had turned them down, turned them down, turned, you know, we had people wanting to come and apprentice for a long time. And we turned them down because we, we thought we didn't have enough work for them. Mm -hmm. And so... This, this fellow I mentioned, this customer that got us into restaurants, he was a quintessential entrepreneur. He like started and sold six businesses in his lifetime, was independently wealthy. 
And um, we, had, we backed into that. What happened was uh, we, had a, we had a lady ask us to raise her uh, some pullets. And so she didn't feel comfortable raising the chicks. So sure, we'll raise them. When you come and, and get them, we'll, you know, uh, when they start to lay, we'll call you and you come and get them. So I don't know, that was two or 300. And uh, so we did, and they got ready to lay. And we said, okay, come get your pullets, your, chi- your birds. And she said, oh, I'll change my mind. I don't want them. Two or 300. Well, you don't tell women to cork it, you know. I mean, they're going to start <laughs> laying eggs. I mean, that's just the way it is, right? And so, and so <laughs> they, they just started laying eggs. And what are we going to do? And, and uh, so we, we, uh, and we started running, you know, buy 10, get one dozen free, you know, all this stuff. Well, this, this guy came in while we were doing it. He says, this is immoral. You've got the best eggs in the world, and you're, you know, giving, it's like giving away gold, whatever. So he, he bought 30, 30 dozen on the spot. And two days later, he came and said, can I have another, uh, can I have 60 dozen? And we said, well, sure. And two days later, he came and said, can I have 90 dozen? Well, we knew he wasn't eating all these. You know, we said, what in the world are you doing with all these eggs? And he was taking them to restaurants up into D.C., taking them back to the chef. Now, this guy was a quintessential entrepreneur. He could sell a hat rack to a moose. And, and, and he, went, he was going back in the kitchen with these eggs, showing it to these chefs. The chefs were going, where would you get these eggs? i got to have these eggs. So he came to us and said, how soon can I get 600 dozen eggs a week from you? Well, we're going to go into business together. 600 dozen. That is a lot of eggs. Yeah, it's almost 100 dozen a day. Well, Which is 1,200 I, eggs. 600, uh, 7,200. Uh, it's 100, it's 100, 100, 600 dozen, dozen times. 100 dozen is 1,200 eggs. Yeah, per day. That's right. That's a lot of per eggs. Per day. <laughs> okay. But my light bulb went off and yeah. said, ah, okay, there's, a, there's a, a, a huge expansion enterprise. And we've got all these young people wanting to be apprentices that we've turned down. But we don't have lodging for them. And so... That was, that was, you know, a, a business never goes in a nice straight line. It's all, it's, you know, it's steps like this. We call that a step year. So that year we put in the apprentice housing for two and, um, and, we, and we started enough pullets to, to expand our layers, a hundred dozen a day, and started the apprenticeship program all in the same year. Now we got enough work. Now we have another enterprise that can support it, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so, so that's what we did. And um, so that's when, we started, that's when we started the apprenticeship program. And, and then 10 years later, we started the stewardship program. And uh, so now we have stewards and apprentices. Uh, apprentices are, uh, stewards can become apprentices. So the apprentices come out of the stewardship. But it's a, it's a formal program. Yeah. And you had a question, and that'd be it. I think you already kind of answered this in a roundabout way. How do you deal with burnout working in the farm environment? Burnout working in the farm environment? Yeah. Do you ever get burnout? Do you ever get tired? Of oh, the my, day? no. Goodness. Uh, no. Burnout. Um, uh, I mean, there are times when you're frustrated. Yeah. Uh, you know, the... You're scheduled to go to a, it always happens on Sunday afternoon, you're supposed to go to a potluck dinner at church and the cows are out. Um, that, that's frustrating, but that's real different than burnout. Um, have no, you, I've, I've never. Have I've, you prevented your burnout? I've not, never. Not, have you prevented not being burnt out? I, I, think, I think how you prevent a burnout is to have a vision big enough. The problem is most people don't have a big enough vision. And, uh, you know, mm. uh, and so our mission statement is to develop economically, ecologically, and emotionally enhancing agricultural prototypes and facilitate their duplication throughout the world. So that's our mission statement. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a big vision. That's a big mission, all right? And so I think if you're... If, if your vision is, is, is precise, measurable, and doable, of course, there's people who say if your vision can be done in your lifetime, it's not big enough. Um, 
But the point is that if it's, if it's noble and sacred and righteous uh, enough, it will, it will propel you forward to accomplish that vision, that mission. Most people, let me just say this, most people are too afraid to create a mission statement because they're too afraid they'll fail. And we, we let me say something really specific here. We grow up pleasing people. We want to please our parents. We want to please the teacher. We want to please the Sunday school teacher. We want to please the preacher. We want to please the, 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 the college professor. We want to please the employer, right? We grow up, we grow up wanting to please everyone and, and too often we've never stopped long enough. Maybe this is a bit of rest, okay? But stop long enough to say, who am I? What would please me? Mm. We, 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 we don't allow ourselves the freedom to dream because we've never given ourselves permission to dream for me. We've been, we've been a part of somebody else's dream. And, and I believe this is one of the single biggest hurdles as we come to adulthood because children they live in this world of fantasy. They can build castles and marry knights in shining armor. And right, they can do, they can do any, they, 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 they dream. Adults, we, we, don't, we don't give ourselves permission to dream because by this time, we're concerned about what other people think. We're concerned about what other people will say. What's, what, what's culturally normative? What's accepted behavior? I mean, you know, name your, na- you know, so we got all this, it's like, it's like we're in a corral, right? We're, we're in, we're in a, a spiritual, emotional, uh, a mental corral, physical even. Oh, you're dyslexic, or you don't speak in front of people very well, right? We got all these, cor- I could never speak in front of people because, you know, they told me I don't speak very well, right? And so we have all these, I, I mean, I'm almost te- tearing up here, th- th- but this is, this is the guts of life, right? This is, this, is, this is real. And, and so what happens is we come into adulthood stricken, corralled, bounded by all these things out here. And we've never looked in the mirror and said, I love you just the way you are. You're good enough. And what would you like to do with your life mm-hmm. if money or time were not an issue and nobody... nobody cared at all what would you do and we've never given ourselves when I left the newspaper and came back to the farm full time there was not a single person in my life including my in-laws including people at work including friends from college including relatives friends except mom and dad and I think mainly dad but who who thought it was a wise decision every single person thought it was the stupidest decision in the world. Leave that paycheck, leave that nice paycheck, you know, and jump off a cliff. Um, but I was, a, I was a dreamer, and I had a, I had a big vision, and, and, uh, and I had a supportive wife who was okay to, to, to go along, and, uh, and, who, and who was, who had enough faith in my ability to make sure that she didn't lose her nest if push came to, we had plan B, plan C, all right? I mean, it, you know, uh, I had a, had a bit of repelling rope in my pocket and a little, you know, parachute, but, you know, we had some plan B, C. I mean, uh, valuable, though. It, it, well, it's absolutely valuable because yeah. women are now, I'm being very sexist here, women are nest builders. No, they no. don't want their nest all torn Are up. You as sexist as you want? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's wisdom. Yeah, that's right. And it actually makes me almost cry. Yeah. I think it shows how much you love her. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. And and, and respected respected her need, her need to know that I wasn't going to tear up her nest on a a crazy idea or a whim or, or whatever. And and so uh, yeah, so that was a big deal. But anyway, I'll I'll stop there. But but uh, but listen, I think I think I think the dreams um, 
giving yourself freedom to dream big and, and nobly and sacredly. Is that a word, sacredly? Uh, <laughs> if it's not, you know what I'm saying. Um, uh, is, 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 a, is a profound thing. And uh, that's why I tell people, don't, don't come to this because it's cool. Don't come to it because you read a cool book. Uh, come to it because it's, it's down in here and it's, and, it's, and, it's, and it's noble and sacred to do. And that will take you past the cows that broke out at four and you're late to the potluck and you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You have to have something, not money, but something in your heart that moves you past the daily frustrations to where you can look out there and see a goal, see a dream, something that's big enough for a legacy for your kids and your tombstone. That's, that's where you need to head. What, what's your tombstone going to read? I would like to think that it would say <sighs> he healed things. Relationships, the land, community, dreams. Mm. Yeah.